I talked to um, Chomsky about him, mm-hmm. went to America mm-hmm. and and Chomsky was um, and he still I saw him recently, I chaired something he was on about a year ago and uh, we talked again about it all, he is comp- absolutely without without a, any qualification uh, for Orwell for. Orwell told the truth, mm. absolutely Orwell yes, told the but... truth, Orwell told it as it was nobody has done it as well as Orwell Welcome to The Literary Hangover I'm your host Matt Leck uh, with me is Alex Guns Hello. Uh, and what you just heard was from the In Our Time podcast on Animal Farm that was from uh, September 2016 Melvin Bragg talks about how he and Chom- he asked Chomsky what he thought about Orwell and Chomsky's a big Orwell guy, which uh, I play that because I Orwell's probably the one figure for me that I feel that way about still. Mm-hmm. Like, there have been writers who have influenced me quite a ways. I mean, Hitchens is maybe the classic example of a writer who I read a lot and then sort of outgrew a little bit. Orwell's one that I, I guess, try and to outgrow, because I think that's something you should do with your heroes. But uh, he's by far my go-to, I think, at these moments. Mm-hmm. He's my uh, my North Star. And the thing about North, the North Star is it's not actually completely North. Oh, really? There, it, I mean, to the visible eye, there's no star exactly where North, true North is. So we just have to go with uh, the North Star because it's, it's approximate. So you'd say they're not the most trustworthy. Well, I'm saying as long as you know the fallibility, it's fairly trustworthy. I, mean, I see. Yeah, yeah. I've used the North Star before. Really? Yeah. I mean, you're from Iowa. Uh, I feel like getting your bearings from the stars is a much more common thing to do in the middle of the country. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess, I mean, I did a lot of like canoe canoeing, but I don't think I ever needed the stars for any kind of guidance. No, but not guidance, but just general orientation. Like, mm, yeah. You see true. like there's Orion's belt, which is only visible in the winter, um, mm-hmm. things like that. Um, anyway, this is too much of a digression on, on astronomy. Uh, today we are talking about a George Orwell essay uh, called Looking Back on the Spanish War, which was printed in a New Road, I think that's a magazine, in 1943. It's not his first essay on the Spanish Civil War. He wrote Spilling the Spanish Beans in 1937 uh, and Homage to Catalonia in 1938. That's a full-length book. It didn't sell very well uh, at the time, but it's since, I think, gotten respect from a large swath of the left that sort of knows Orwell a bit better because... You know, you have Animal Farm in, in 1984, which are the very much, the, the, the dystopian novels. Like, this is a revolution gone wrong. And they're pretty much required reading, too, right? Exactly. Homage is a bit more underground, but it's it's maybe one of the most famous representations of our actual revolution in real life. Uh, yeah. Orwell says he gets to Barcelona, and it's the first time he's seen a, been in a city with the working class in the saddle and a lot of stuff like that. So... Uh, but Alex, you wanted to uh, do this essay. Was there, I mean, we'll probably get to the specific section later that you thought was relevant, but mm-hmm. is there anything else that you want to say about this? Um, yeah, I, I was reading through Orwell's essays at the beginning of the year, uh, this year, and I remember just coming across this essay in, in particular. And I've read Homage to Catalonia and some of his other writings about uh, the Spanish Civil War. And this essay just struck me because it just sent, it seemed so relevant and it seemed like an essay that was reaching out to the reader today because it was he saw it as like a conscious the way he frames it part of the essay is it's like a conscious defining moment where it's like like a barrier you have to get through to get to modernity now that it changed the world uh psychically so much yeah i would say it almost set the terms that we're basically fighting now there's a continuity of time of like eras yeah i think it's definitely right like where the the current battle lines you see solidifying in what everyone keeps saying is an increasingly divided country in America, for instance. Yeah, it provides the opposite of what like the World War II narrative provides, which is World War II provides closure, and it's like pretty by the by forty one to the end, it's pretty uh, like one sided, mm-hmm. <laughs> like or it's pretty morally uh, non ambiguous. Whereas the Spanish Civil War, there is no there is no uh, conclusion. It just kind of ekes the war itself ends but the conflict just kind of ekes on and then slowly just seeps into modernity which is kind of where we're at yeah and to to summarize the spanish civil war very very briefly i think it's 1931 uh, there's sort of a republican electoral revolution where the sort of republican left and democratic left 
and socialistic left in parts uh, comes to power, Spanish people vote to have a republic and get rid of the monarchy a few years later, uh, and all during this time, uh, over the course of the early 30s. There are coups being planned and even attempted, and then finally Francisco Franco, a general, comes from Morocco and uh, basically starts an invasion that eventually turns into uh, Franco's dictatorship for like 40 plus years. So, Alex, you wanted to give us a little bit of background into the... There's a a huge religious valence to this conflict. It's interesting to, to untangle a little bit because... The Anthony Beaver book, the the Battle for Spain, goes into the fact that you know, it was only about one in five Spanish people who were weekly churchgoers. Um, so the people themselves weren't as religious as portrayed in the press at the time. Um, like this was, uh, but anyway, if you want to set those up for us a little bit, uh, yeah, Spain has a really unique history when it comes to um, Christendom, and that it's it was one of the few places that would be considered immune from the Reformation. And that was by design, primarily, that we kind of forget now, at least, I don't know, in, in popular conversation, it's kind of forgotten that for about 400 to 500 years, the Iberian Peninsula, which is now Spain, uh, was largely dominated by the Umayyad Caliphate, which was a, a, a Muslim caliphate, obviously. And until about 1000, it, we, it's commonly referred to now as Al-Andalus, at that point in history, Al-Andalus would be um, the most populated, uh, uh, would control the most populated cities in Europe. And you had Jews, Muslims, and Christians essentially living in this metropolitan uh, uh, world. And the Umayyad Caliphate went through Egypt surrounding the Mediterranean. And they were able to get a number of Roman and Greek codex. And they ended up being like the, the center of learning around the year like 1,000 up to like uh, 11,000 for the most part. Mm. Um, and they, they put, so who was there before was like these Visigothic warlords and they were demolished within seven years. This is around um, 711 AD. Right around 1,000 to 1,100, which is roughly when the Crusades are going on, there's some pushback because the Visigoths have this little teeny wedge on the northernmost uh, part of the Iberian Peninsula, which is now like right by the Pyrenees. Mm-hmm. So over the course of about 400 years, there's this thing that's called the Reconquista, which is this attempt to take over Umayyad Caliphate controlled areas. And eventually the Umayyads are kicked out by another, the Berbers, but we won't get into that. They actually, by 1249, are able to push uh, Muslim control all the way down to Granada, which is the southernmost uh, point of Iberia, which is uh, borders the Mediterranean. But unfortunately, there's these multiple kingdoms, and it's um, Castile, Aragon, and Navarre, and they're, they're these Christian kingdoms, and they're constantly fighting with each other. Like So they're basically, life on the Iberian Peninsula is continuous civil war between these Christian kingdoms. And the central power of the monarch in Castile keeps getting diluted by these nobles and lords. And so eventually, in the 15th century, there's this monarch, Henry IV, and he's considered impotent, and he actually has to like, ha- like have his wife artificially inseminated to have a child, and that does happen successfully. But unfortunately, word gets out, and everyone's like, "Well, he's not a real king, and that's not a real, uh, wow. <laughs> a real offspring." <laughs> and so he has a uh, he has a half sister who's uh, Isabella of Castile, and the nobles pick her because she's twenty at the time, and they're like, "Well, we'll back her in this. We'll foment civil war and back her, and then we can control her." Unfortunately for them, it uh, turned out Isabella was uh, an autocratic lunatic. There's, I can't remember who said it, but there's some there's some famous phrase, I think maybe from England, where it's like the worst thing, the most dangerous thing on earth is a king who actually thinks that they're a king, like that they're here for to do God's work. Oh, right. And so Isabella was had, was a big fan of Joan of Arc, and she was going to unite uh, Spain. Oh dear. So she actually ended up uniting Spain uh, by marrying the king of um, Aragon. Uh, Ferdinand. And so they unite Spain that way. And then through her big thing is uh, she wants to start a war on crime, that she thinks that crime is too rampant mm. in the Spanish kingdoms. I wonder if that was, was that racialized at all? That war Not yet. Crime? It no. becomes racialized because okay. it's she, the Christians are too lax, basically, that her impotent brother was allowing anyone to get away with anything from rape to not going to church on Sundays, which were equally bad. Right. Yeah, totally. So eventually she invades she after she stabilized she finally collapses these different king these different christian kingdoms and that is essentially what becomes spain but there's still this muslim outpost which is the emirate of granada in 1482 so she's crowned in 1474 and consolidates uh these multiple christian kingdoms in 1482 she invades granada 
after an eight-month siege, siege at the Alhambra, finally kicks out the last of the Muslim rulers and creates what is now Spain. Now, through that, there's another program that she creates with that, which is the Inquisition, which is what we all know. She said, because there happened to be a lot of Jews living in this Muslim area, and she absolutely could not tolerate that. Mm. So she either said, you, you either have to leave, so it was forced deportation of what we think is now probably 800,000 people to, Jesus. Yeah, to <laughs> Portugal and to Northern uh, Africa. And then you either, or if you didn't want to leave, you had to publicly um, convert to Christianity, which is kind of like now, like, be a citizen or get out. Right. We want, we, we're just civic nationalists. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it was actually a, a very gendered thing because it was all based, like, they would go after conversios, which is like people who said they converted a long time ago, that they used to be Jewish, now they're Christian. But the way they would target these people is like based on accusations on their dietary planning. Because like, oh, well, really, you're a Jew. So really, they, the, the, one of the forgotten things about the Inquisition is it actually targeted women primarily, because it, it was about how you would, uh, dealt and prepared food in the kitchen. Um, anyway, so they're able to expel all the Jews. The Pope is actually kind of freaking out about it. He's like, you're going way too far. And she's like, well, I'm the monarch of this. Like, I'm the one who says, like, what's going to happen in, in my country? I'm more Catholic than you, basically. And then eventually... Like, well, we should kick out all the Muslims, but there's even more Muslims and Jews. And she's like, I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> but the church was just like, well, we're just going to start doing it and basically start forcing, converting. And then they eventually did expel all the Muslims as well. Mm. Um, and then, and so, oh, yeah. So in that moment when she's, when the handover happens at the Alhambra Palace, uh, Christopher Columbus is there. Uh, he witnessed it because that was January 1492. Oh. And he's, she's the one who funds his expedition to uh, what eventually is the Americas. But his whole thing is like, I'm so inspired by you, Isabella. I would like to go to the go around the world to the Holy Land and reclaim it for you. Right. So that's the if you want to know where the discovery of the Americas came from, it came from that cultural milieu for the most part. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So and then the other aspect of uh, Spanish culture that we I want to touch on is the sort of radical anarchist side of it. Anthony Beaver's book, um, which actually. The Battle for Spain. Uh, I I wasn't prepared to take much from it. I guess the first time because the second time this is, the second time through. I I think it's a really great book. Here's a good section on the uh, anarchism of uh, the sort of how that came to Spain, uh, as opposed to sort of the Marxist sorts of socialism. The first attempt to organize some form of trade union in Spain had occurred as early as the 1830s, and there were small non political associations in existence at the middle of the 19th century. Then new political ideas arrived across the Pyrenees and began to take root. The anarchist or libertarian form of socialism arrived first, and its fundamental disagreement with Marxist socialism was to have great repercussions in Spain. Proudhon had already been translated by P.E. Marcal, the president of the First Republic, when Giuseppe Fanelli arrived in Spain in 1868. Fanelli was an admirer of Bakunin, Marx's great opponent in the First International. He came to Madrid without speaking any Spanish and with no money, but the idea, as it became known, found a very enthusiastic audience. Within four years, there were nearly 50,000 Bakunists in Spain, of whom the majority were in Andalusia. There were several reasons why anarchism in the early days became the largest force within the Spanish working class. Its proposed structure of cooperative communities associating freely corresponded to deep-rooted traditions of mutual aid, and the Federalist organization appealed to anti-centralist feelings. It also offered a strong moral alternative to a corrupt political system and hypocritical church. Many observers had pointed to the naive optimism which anarchism inspired among the landless peasants of Andalusia. Much has also been made of the way in which the word was spread by ascetic, almost saint-like characters, and how the converts gave up tobacco, alcohol, and infidelity while rejecting official marriage. As a result, it was often described as a secular religion. Even so, the intensity of this early anarchism led converts to believe that everybody else must see that freedom and mutual aid were the only foundation of a naturally ordered society. An uprising was all that was needed to open people's eyes, unfetter the vast potential of goodwill, and set off what Bakunin called the spontaneous creativity of the masses. Their frustration at being unable to unlock the mechanism of history, as the Russian writer Victor Serge described it, led to individual acts of political violence in the 1890s. The Tigres Solitarios, as their fellow anarchists called them, acted either in the hope of stirring up others to emulate them, or in reprisal for the indiscriminate brutality of the Brigada Social, the secret police. 
The most famous example was the torturing to death in 1892 of several anarchists in the castle of Monjuic in Barcelona. This led to an international outcry and to the assassination of Canovas del Castillo, the organizer of the restoration. A vicious circle of repression and revenge was to follow. During the last quarter of the 19th century, the Marxist wing of socialism, Los Autoritarios, as their opponents called them, developed much less rapidly. In late 1871, Karl Marx's son-in-law, Paul Lafargue, arrived after the fall of the Paris Commune, and within a year the basis of Spanish socialism was laid in Madrid. The Marxists' comparative lack of success was partly due to the emphasis which they placed on the central state. The socialists under Pablo Iglesias, a typesetter who emerged as the leading Spanish Marxist, proceeded cautiously and concentrated on building an organization. Eventually, in 1879, they founded the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party, PSOE, and formed their General Union of Labour, UGT, in 1888. Iglesias still insisted that the class struggle should be waged in a moderate and evolutionary manner. The PSOE did not formally repudiate the monarchy until 1914. The socialists accused their anarchist rivals of irresponsibility, but they in turn were seen as heavily bureaucratic and received the nickname of Spanish Prussians. Yeah, so that sort of gives you the background between the sort of anarchist versus a socialist or communist split. I mean, I know it's like the Freddie Simpson's heads out there that the it's like the cliche to be like X place is a land of contrast. But right, yeah. <laughs> but really, it really compared to other countries in the the European mainland, Spain really is a unique place when it comes to not just different cultures, but massive swaths of different cultures that have to live right next to each other. And in some cases, it's actually extremely successful. Mm -hmm. And then in some cases, that can be weaponized and it becomes some of the worst, like the worst European brutality uh, is in that very like Iberian Peninsula. Yeah, it's weird. It's almost like a early or like a type of America. Like you have the yeah. Catalonia stuff, you have the Andalusia, which just to place those, like Catalonia will be up by the Pyrenees, the northeastern mm -hmm. portion of it. Andalusia is the part with like the great, or uh, Strait of Gibraltar, the southern yeah. tip of it. Let's move a little bit to uh, Orwell's part in all of this. Orwell, during all this time, is uh, writing. He writes a few books. Uh, he's about ready to publish one called The Road to Wigan Pier about his time in sort of a uh, industrially a mining town uh, in in England and talks about sort of like the class and so it, it's it's a very good book to read actually if you're a socialist um, and that's published by a guy named Victor Galanz who runs a left wing book club and he's trying to get that published. There's already some sort of infighting on the left, so there's some some politics going on there. Shocking. And uh, and this sort of goes into. And as this is happening, Orwell is try wants to go fight uh, in the Spanish Civil War because at this point, it's not seen as like a uh, uh, outside of Spain. It's viewed in the pre through the press as simply democracy versus fascism. Uh, more revolutionary elements of it, where we're they're building the, they're trying to form a class of society in parts of Spain, is hushed up because at the time, basically the yeah the dynamic, and we'll get into this a little bit more, is but. You want you don't want to scare away the French and the British because they have a bunch of people who like the property system as it is. So yeah. you just want it, this to be against the scary fascists um, who are against democracy. And, and it, correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't there's a um, the popular understanding for at least the first year internationally was that there's no chance that the fascists could win. Also, I thought it was that it was such a like a fringe possibility that everyone kind of. Like one of the slow, one of the reasons that was people were slow, like the left was slow to get involved because they just thought, well, there's no way. It's possible, although the like Mussolini and Hitler were in there right away. Yeah, I think at that. Least. Was, yeah, I thought that. Yeah, the the is it Bevor is that how you say his last yep. name? Yeah, I think his book kind of outlined that there was just like the popular consensus was that it was hard to imagine, even though that yeah that Hitler and Mussolini were moving at a rapid uh, pace. Yeah, and then but ultimately what happens is uh, Franco is kicking ass until. Yeah. And the the Republican slash socialist, uh, which by which I basically mean not n anarchist, uh, government can't uh, match up to Franco. It's basically the anarchists' workers who are able to give uh, Franco his first defeat. And uh, so here's where Orwell goes to Spain. This is Orwell by Michael Sheldon. As Golan's well knew, his author was in no position to give a timely response. When the book was published, Orwell whom Golan's rebukes for failing to recognize the proper way to defeat fascism, 
was in a muddy trench on a remote hilltop in Spain, dodging sniper fire from a fascist army. Two. When Orwell went to Spain, he was not certain that he would fight. He lacked neither courage nor conviction, but he doubted whether he had the stamina or the skill to be a good soldier. And because of the chronic weakness of his lungs, he suspected that he would be turned down for health reasons if he tried to enlist. But he did not rule out joining one of the Spanish political militias if it became clear that they could use him. In the meantime, he decided that the best way to serve the cause was to observe the war and write about it to the New Statesman or for some other English paper that was sympathetic to the Republican government. He'd been told that he would not be permitted to enter Spain without some supporting documents from a British left-wing organization. As he learned later, this warning was inaccurate, but he did not want to take the chance that he would be turned away at the frontier. So he sought the assistance of the one left-wing organization in London, whose name would mean something even to the most backward Spanish border guard. He went to the British Communist Party and managed to put his request directly to its chief, Harry Pollitt. He and Pollitt had never met, but Pollitt seems to have taken an immediate dislike to him. He must have smelled the blood of a right-wing deviationist when Orwell walked into his office, because he began to question him carefully and soon concluded that his visitor was politically unreliable. He refused to help him and ended their interview. It was a distinctly unpleasant meeting, and Pollitt's memory of it may have caused him to launch his highly personal attack on Orwell three months later in his daily worker review of The Road to Wigan Pier. Not only did he dismiss the writer as a disillusioned middle-class boy, but he also ridiculed him for daring to speak out on a subject that he does not understand. After Pollitt's hostile reception of him, Orwell telephoned the headquarters of the Independent Labour Party, and its officials readily agreed to help him. He was given a letter of introduction to the ILP's Barcelona representative, John McNair. With this matter settled, he was ready to set off for Spain. After saying goodbye to Eileen, he began his journey, travelling first to Paris, where he paid a brief visit to Henry Miller, who told him that the idea of going to Spain was sheer stupidity. <laughs> Why get involved in someone else's fight? Miller asked. In 1940, Orwell recalled their meeting and the forcible way in which Miller had advocated the merits of selfishness and political indifference. So that's a little bit of uh, Orwell leading and how he got to uh, Spain. I think it's interesting. He tries to be a communist to get yeah. over there, and they're like, "No, you, you." There's something off about Orwell. I wonder if it's just because there's a there's another essay about you know his experience in boarding school, and I wonder if he can't shed that kind of pedigree. Uh, that you wouldn't know, normally associate with like a communist radical. That's people who are like in the uh, resistance see him. And it's like, you seem more like uh, a dandy, <laughs> if anything. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I wonder how much of it is based on like, like Orwell's not, he, he's not a member of the British Communist Party. He's yeah. a member of the Independent Labor Party. So it's like he's, 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 he's never part of the main teams, or whatever. He's yeah. too, he's too, um, He's he, he's too, I guess, contrarian for that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, even, that's why he ends up uh, sort of with the Trotskyists. Uh, it is kind of mysterious that he did decide he was radical and he was radicalized enough to go fight in a different country's war, essentially. Yeah, I think he, I mean, he liked to do things. I mean, a brief summary of Orwell's life is he finishes sort of, I guess, the British equivalent of high school. Doesn't go to Oxford or Cambridge, but goes to basically be a policeman in the British yeah. Raj in India. That's his early 20s. He comes back and he writes a few books and a couple novels, all very preoccupied with sort of class and work and money and stuff like that. One of them's uh, down and out in Paris and London. He works as like a dishwasher and sort of goes as a, as a, as a tramp through those cities he likes to get amongst it basically he uh and then i don't know it's a, it's a that is like the greatest generation thing right like you just go for it it's hard not to read him as a deeply moral figure mm. especially people that we've been reading that we i think we kind of like there's so there is a, you can relish in like a certain like a, a writer's flaws kind of because it is you know it's interesting and relatable and so it makes him complex whereas or orwell sometimes does kind of come off as like a paragon of virtue that you almost can't you can't break through to find like the human Orwell. Yeah. So I suppose let's uh, let's actually get to this essay. This looking back on the Spanish War. Now, like I said, this is the third time he's written about Spain. Now, Patreon.com/slash Literary Hangover because we're going to start a new series just for patrons. 
that is basically going through Orwell essays called Orweller. They might be, they probably will be released uh, later on. Oh, you got, what is that? This is all of them. Wow. This is what nice. made me want to read it. This, there's a modern library, or no, sorry, Every Man's Library has an excellent collection of every single essay and like any article that he wrote. Oh, it's about, wow. It's about, it's a little over 1,300 pages, but I read it in uh, this winter and it was uh, a blast. <laughs> yeah. So pre- I, I have a, I have a P, uh, ebook called 50 Essays from Orwell, which you can get on the Australia's Australian Project Gutenberg. <laughs> Um, oh wow! I didn't realize that there was in different hemispheres. Yeah, there's different for that stuff. Um, but uh, Orwell's the best. So we're going to be doing a lot more Orwell essays, but just uh, for premium subs- or patron subscribers at the first. So Patreon.com/slash/LiteraryHangover. If you're not there, if you are, you're going to get some more content. So yeah, so this is looking back on the Spanish War. It's the first one he wrote, "Spilling the Spanish Beans," which was in 1937, is. Very much aimed at sort of the... Uh, so basically, Orwell gets over there and works for this militia called the Poom, the, the, uh, which is... They're called the Trotskyist Party, but Trotsky himself was uh, at odds with them. So like this is this is how you get with the left, I guess. Oh, man. Um, uh, and I'm not entirely sure what's, what distinguishes the Trotskyists from the anarchists in this, except like they like Marx and the anarchists are suspicious of Marx, I mm-hmm. guess. Maybe there's something more to that, if you know uh, at Lit Hangover on Twitter. But the, the Trotskyists and the anarchists want to continue the revolution. They want to keep uh, expropriating private property from the, the oligarchy and the church and, and uh, those sorts of groups. Whereas the sort of Republicans slash Democratic slash Socialistic slash Communists who are in government uh, and liberals... Uh, they want to pause the revolution for a little bit and all have a united front against fascism and actually spilling the Spanish beans or will cause like goes off on that. So if you, if you want more on that, check it out there. The only p- people who are willing to give guns to Spain are in Mexico and Russia. And even then it's not that much, but just because the USSR is one of the uh, great powers to give guns, they get influence and ultimately they, not only pause the revolution, but try to turn or successfully turn a lot of the gains made by the revolution back. And Orwell dislikes that. So Orwell's critique of Stalin originally comes from the left of Stalin, that Stalin's not re- is counter revolutionary. Um, so actually, let's go in t- and this was all portrayed massively cynically in the press. And a lot of uh, the, the beginning of this essay is Orwell taking a stab at sort of, um, press complicity or or misinformation. Looking back on the Spanish War. First of all, the physical memories, the sounds, the smells, and the surfaces of things. It is curious that more vividly than anything that came afterwards in the Spanish War, I remember the week of so-called training that we received before being sent to the front. The huge cavalry barracks in Barcelona with its drafty stables and cobbled yards. The icy cold of the pump where one washed the filthy meals made tolerable by pannikins of wine, the trousered militia women chopping forward, and the roll call in the early mornings where my prosaic English name made a sort of comic interlude among the resounding Spanish ones. So the first part of this essay is Orwell sort of putting you in the location, and Mm -hmm. you get the sights and smells, the latrine and everything like that, and he's doing that to set up uh, the readers for a critique of how the media reacted to... Uh, the Spanish War, especially on the left, he 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 says like, of course you can criticize the right, but this but that goes almost without saying. Yeah, like assume it's a given. Yeah, the bomb is a bomb, even though the cause you are fighting for happens to be just. Why is it worthwhile to point out anything so obvious? Because the bulk of the British and American intelligentsia were manifestly unaware of it then and are now. Our memories are short nowadays. But look back a bit, dig out the files of new masses or the daily worker, and just have a look at the romantic warmongering muck that our left-wingers were spilling at that time. All the stale old phrases, and the unimaginative callousness of it, the sang froid with which London faced the bombing of Madrid. Here I am not bothering about the counter-propagandists of the right, the Luns, Garvins, et hoc genus. They go without saying. But here were the very people who for twenty years had hooted and jeered at the glory of war, at atrocity stories, at patriotism, even at physical courage. 
If there was one thing that the British intelligentsia were committed to, it was the debunking version of war. The theory that war is all corpses and latrines and never leads to any good result. Well, the same people who in 1933 sniggered pityingly if you said that in certain circumstances you would fight for your country, in 1937 were denouncing you as a Trotsky fascist. If you suggested that the stories in new masses about freshly wounded men clamoring to get back into the fighting might be exaggerated. And the left intelligentsia made their swing over from war is hell to war is glorious, not only with no sense of incongruity, but almost without any intervening stage. That's very classic Orwell. Yeah, oh yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know how to describe it. You probably can better because you know him better, but it's like. You know, I, I, comparing him to Hitchens is like a something Hitchens would have welcomed, I think. Yeah, but, Hitchens wishes. Yeah, yeah. And I think that as far as put-downs go, Hitchens is so much more like verbose and so much mm. more like inflammatory. Whereas Orwell, he does, he can, he's so distra- he's so demolishing, but in such like a curt, polite manner. Yeah. Not curt, <laughs> soft, polite manner. Yeah, it, Hitchens is more like grenades. Yeah. And Orwell, like, he's not without... Orwell, when he goes after somebody, he can really uh, uh, go after him. He goes after Auden. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, basically, for it says, like, so much to the left is, like... Uh, Auden says the phrase necessary murder in a poem, and Orwell says, Personally, I would not speak so lightly of murder. To me, murder is something to be avoided. So it is uh, to any ordinary person. The Hitlers and Stalins find murder necessary, but they don't advertise their callousness, and they don't speak of it as murder. It is liquidation, elimination, or some other soothing phrase. Mr. Auden's brand of amoralism is only possible if you are the kind of person who is always somewhere else when the trigger is pulled. I mean, yeah, it's tough when you're, when you're being called up by a guy who is shot in the throat by a fascist. Yeah, Auden replied, I was not excusing totalitarian crimes, but only trying to say what surely every decent person thinks if he finds himself unable to adopt the uh, absolute pacifist, blah, 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 whatever. Um, uh, yeah. I, I think it is pretty much established. I think Adam Hochschild in his book gets into Auden basically being, like he was only shown what they wanted him to see. He was sort of like the naive uh, writer brought in to propagandize. Uh, yeah, there's a big controversy where he kept platforming uh, Ezra Pound after he had been jailed for um, treason because mm. he was doing radio broadcasts for Mussolini to try to demoralize uh, the allied troops. And Auden was like, listen, like, does, does he say that in the poem? And, but the thing is like, one of them was like usura about like international usury. So it's like, yes, in the poem, he was being a fascist. Right. Yeah. Uh, so here's Orwell again, going in on some newspaper men. In 1935, shouted for a firm line against Germany in 1937, supported the People's Convention in 1940, and are demanding a second front now. As far as the mass of the people go, the extraordinary swings of opinion which occur nowadays, the emotions which can be turned on and off like a tap, are the result of newspaper and radio hypnosis. In the intelligentsia, I should say, they result rather from money and mere physical safety. At a given moment, they may be pro-war or anti-war, but in either case, they have no realistic picture of war in their minds. When they enthused over the Spanish War, they knew, of course, that people were being killed, and that to be killed is unpleasant. But they did feel that for a soldier in the Spanish Republican Army, the experience of war was somehow not degrading. Somehow the latrines stank less. Discipline was less irksome. You have only to glance at the new statesmen to see that they believe that. Exactly similar blah is being written about the Red Army at this moment. We have become too civilized to grasp the obvious. For the truth is very simple. To survive, you often have to fight. And to fight, you have to dirty yourself. War is evil, and it is often the lesser evil. Those who take the sword perish by the sword, and those who don't take the sword perish by smelly diseases. The fact that such a platitude is worth writing down shows what the years of rentier capitalism have done to us. There's a feminist critique of Orwell, which is that he puts this sort of liber- these sort of liberations always in a sort of martial context, mm. uh, and therefore sort of masculine, right? Like his, 
in homage to Catalonia, it talks about how the face of an Italian militia man, a young militia man, is sort of that's the future of uh, you know for people in Europe. Yeah, and uh, and I think that is an interesting critique because it is all like you know it's. It, it is writing about what you know, right? He was a policeman in India, a yeah. colonial policeman in India. He fought in uh, fascists in the Spanish Civil War, and he was uh, a member of the BBC during uh, World War II. You can see that he never sheds, he never fully sheds that kind of policeman on the beat point of view. And sometimes it, it comes to help, and then sometimes it can you can see him. It simplifies his prose a little bit, but the idea that there is this kind of like bestial nature in mankind that you're a fool to ignore, then the, the more refined you get, the more you forget that the majority of everyday reality is based on uh, uh, material things. Two, in connection with what I've just said, a footnote on atrocities. I have little direct evidence about the atrocities in the Spanish Civil War, I know that some were committed by the Republicans, and far more, they're still continuing, by the fascists. But what impressed me then, and has impressed me ever since, is that atrocities are believed in or disbelieved in solely on grounds of political predilection. Everyone believes in the atrocities of the enemy and disbelieves in those of his own side, without ever bothering to examine the evidence. Recently, I drew up a table of atrocities during the period between 1918 and the present. There was never a year when atrocities were not occurring somewhere or other, and there was hardly a single case when the left and the right believed in the same stories simultaneously. And stranger yet, at any moment the situation can suddenly reverse itself, and yesterday's proved to the hilt atrocity story can become a ridiculous lie, merely because the political landscape has changed. In the present war, we are in the curious situation that our atrocity campaign was done largely before the war started, and done mostly by the left, the people who normally pride themselves on their incredulity. In the same period, the right, the atrocity mongers of 1914 to 18, were gazing at Nazi Germany and flatly refusing to see any evil in it. As soon as war broke out, it was the pro-Nazis of yesterday who were repeating horror stories, while the anti-Nazis suddenly found themselves doubting whether the Gestapo really existed. Nor was this solely the result of the Russo-German pact. It was partly because before the war the left had wrongly believed that Britain and Germany would never fight, and were therefore able to be anti-German and anti-British simultaneously. Partly also because official war propaganda, with its disgusting hypocrisy and self-righteousness, always tends to make thinking people sympathize with the enemy. Part of the price we paid for the systematic lying of 1914 to 18 was the exaggerated pro-German reaction which followed. During the years 1918 to 1933, you were hooted at in left-wing circles if you suggested that Germany bore even a fraction of responsibility for the war. In all the denunciations of Versailles I listened to during those years, I don't think I ever once heard the question, what would have happened if Germany had won, even mentioned, let alone discussed. So also with atrocities. The truth, it is felt, becomes untruth when your enemy utters it. Recently I noticed that the very people who swallowed any and every horror story about the Japanese in Nanking in 1937 refused to believe exactly the same stories about Hong Kong in 1942. There was even a tendency to feel that the Nanking atrocities had become, as it were, retrospectively untrue because the British government now drew attention to them. But unfortunately, the truth about atrocities is far worse than that they are lied about and made into propaganda. The truth is that they happen. The fact often adduced as a reason for scepticism, that the same horror stories come up in war after war, merely makes it rather more likely that these stories are true. Evidently, they are widespread fantasies, and war provides an opportunity of putting them into practice. Also, although it has ceased to be fashionable, before we get to that part, which I really like, it this essay uh, uh, 
it's it is very timely because we are all freaking out about this whole fake news. How can we 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 can't agree on what's real anymore? And I guess the point is like this is not anything new at all. Yeah, I, th- I think that's what stuck out the most when I was reading that essay. Is it finally someone correctly diagnosed the symptoms of modernity for me? That it's like yes, this is the world that I feel like I'm living in. Exactly. Or nothing. No, there can be no statement of fact that isn't like it doesn't have a thousand different points of view behind it that it's like, well, if you say that, then you must say this. Yeah. And wasn't produced by power. And yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry. But like, I think of that with like, you know, the, the current ethnic cleansing that is happening in this country. Right. And it's absolutely impossible to grab on to anything. Everything melts into thin air when you try to be like, like, okay, there are people in concentration camps currently. Right. It's like, that's got to be for people who we consider themselves like a moral person or whatever, like that's it. Like it's gotta be it. But it's like, it's the conversation spins out of like, uh, that's not really happening or it's, we know that's, that's already been happening for a very long time. And it's like, well, no, it hasn't. But even if it has, who cares? Like, right. And also it's, it's sort of like, well, yeah, we can, we have the people in the camps, but we just need everybody to come together for common sense. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, immigration reform. It's like, no, we need to stop being fucking Nazis. Yeah, it's like crackpot logic, which is like, well, how do we come together on this? Like, you cannot, like, yeah. morally. <laughs> um, and uh, and just to um, underline that point, Orwell does not do both sides when it comes to atrocities. Here he is. Rather more likely that these stories are true. Evidently, they're widespread fantasies, and war provides an opportunity of putting them into practice. Also, although it has ceased to be fashionable to say so, There is little question that what one may roughly call the whites commit far more and worse atrocities than the reds. Reds being the sort of like radical reformers, whites being the sort of property and powerful classes, basically. And that comes from the white army, right, in Russia Russia? during the Civil War after the Revolution? I think so, yeah. yeah. There is not the slightest doubt, for instance, about the behavior of the Japanese in China. Nor is there much doubt about the long tail of fascist outrages during the last ten years in Europe. The volume of testimony is enormous, and a respectable proportion of it comes from the German press and radio. These things really happened. That is the thing to keep one's eye on. They happened even though Lord Halifax said they happened. The raping and butchering in Chinese cities the tortures in the cellars of the Gestapo, the elderly Jewish professors flung into cesspools, the machine-gunning of refugees along the Spanish roads. They all happened, and they did not happen any the less because the Daily Telegraph has suddenly found out about them when it is five years too late. This is always just very wry. Yeah. I think just, just very casually punctures a hole into, like, the concept of progress, which I think is so important to just about everyone. Right. That we are getting better primarily through technological achievement. He's like, basically like, no, it's a disaster. Like modernity is a disaster for the average person. Yeah. Orwell is uh, also a very good at, um, uh, he was on board with the techno skepticism. Like technology is not going to save you folks. Don't expect it to. Um, and yeah, if I can do one quick side note with the, um, the way he talks about the press, you know, opinions changing from day to day. Uh, there's a corollary I really like, which is uh, the printing press being invented in the in 1440 was hailed as this like ability to uh, liberate mankind from like the from power because it's like you can educate yourself and you can right. uh, you can be your own master. Uh, but what happens is the first printing press shows up in Spain in 1474, which is the exact year that Isabella of Castile is inaugurated uh, as or, or crowned as queen. And she's like, this is great. <laughs> and she's the only person in Spain her whole life that has a printing press. And so she there's these uh, there's these courtiers who record uh, uh, the life of like what's happening in court. But those things would usually come out ten like in 10 year intervals, basically. And this is what, you know, the king was doing at X time. And it's like this romantic way of um uh propagandizing the uh um king but now isabella is like oh we can release this daily so she's like she would she hired multiple uh courtiers to record what she was doing and she's like whoever can make it more extravagant 
I'll, I'll pay more. Mm. So all of a sudden, there's this, this, for the first time in European history, there's this rapid propaganda machine for, for made on this thing that's supposed to liberate mankind. Weird. And she's using it as a way to be like, I can actually, uh, and, and, and she would, there was two things she would like, she would want printed, like would to elevate her as almost to godlike status and any kind of information you could find on Jews or Muslims that are, Jesus. make them horrible, like make sure that the people know about of course, that. Because right. it's horrible. It's yeah. horrible what they're doing. Oh, man. I mean, good thing that never happened with any other sort of communications technology. Yeah, yeah. Good, good thing, like, the sort of radio... Uh, Social media, Twitter. Yeah, well, like, uh, in the uh, in Our Time for the Spanish Civil War, it's a good episode of In Our Time. They talk about, like, there's a rural-urban divide in Spain, and <laughs> there's a lot of new technologies like radio, and and the people in, behind, feeling left behind, it's like, oh, boy. Oh yeah, and uh, just to, just in case you think Orwell's biased because he was fighting the fascists uh, to say that um, fascist violence or right wing violence is typically worse than left wing violence, it is just true, and it's something that if you feel the need to play both sides of it over, you're not actually being wise; you're being uh, a sucker. Uh, and <laughs> such um, a fine line. Yeah, uh, Anthony Beevor, who's uh, a mainstream historian concurs with uh, what Orwell says. Here's what he said. And it, it's interesting because the, the worst atrocities were also perpetrated by the sort of um, revolutionaries or socialists or Republicans, who, uh, whoever, against the clergy. Uh, and those were al- also the most publicized because the church has a good propaganda organ. Yeah. Uh, and a and, good network, you could say. Yeah, exactly. So we everybody heard about it. They, like if a priest w- got killed... To me, those sorts of killings aren't, generally speaking, it's because like there's a collapse in 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 the state, and so there's like some random killings. But on the right wing side of things, the government there's it's it's still systematic. They're in charge of everything. It's not like it's it's more of a policy mm-hmm. than random acts of violence. Carlist Riquetes making a Republican lie in the form of a cross before hacking off his limbs to the cry of "Long live Christ the King." If people in other countries were reminded of the Thirty Years' War or the religious persecutions of the Dark Ages and shuddered at this new barbarism, it was not surprising. The slaughter did not follow the same pattern on each side. In nationalist territory, the relentless purging of Reds and Atheists was to continue for years, while in Republican territory, the worst of the violence was mainly a sudden and quickly spent reaction of suppressed fear, exacerbated by desires of revenge for the past. The attacks on the clergy were bound to cause the greatest stir abroad, where there was little understanding of the Church's powerful political role. The Catholic Church was the bulwark of the country's conservative forces, the foundation of what the right defined as Spanish civilization. Not surprisingly, the outside world had a fixed impression of Spain as a deeply religious country. The jest of the Basque philosopher Unamuno, that in Spain even atheists were Catholic, was taken seriously. (laughs) Centuries of fanatical superstition enforced by the Inquisition had engraved this image on European minds. Even so, it was surprising how few foreign newspapers made the connection between the religious repression dating back to the Middle Ages and the violent anti-clericalism that developed in the 19th century. The rage which led to such excesses in some areas was fired by one great conviction. The promise of heaven for the meek was the age-old trick by the rich and powerful to make the poor accept their lot on earth. Yeah, and uh, elsewhere he says basically the church is seen by workers and radicals as the sort of psychological operations wing of the state. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think I just think like that is important to stress because, and that's what that's one of the reasons I admire Orwell so well is like he doesn't come out of this saying you know atrocities on both sides is fine, very fine people on both yeah, yeah, sides yeah. of it. And like no, there's right and wrong here. And sometimes chickens come home to roost. Nobody should die in violence, but fundamentally, like what the church was doing to the Spanish, the Spanish people in general was like long-term violence. Yeah. And I think it's impossible to ignore, although it actually it's ignored quite well currently, but it's yeah. impossible in this context, if you're looking at it seriously, to ignore the fact that at this moment in time, the Catholic church is fully intertwined with Mussolini's uh, fascist program. Right. That the... That the that uh, the Vatican that is current that where the Pope currently resides is a minor state that was built exclusively by Mussolini to buy them off to essentially 
uh, help publish his uh, fascist propaganda at pulpits all over the world, which they did knowingly. Hmm. So now we're going to skip a little bit ahead. We're going to skip some very interesting parts, and uh, I'll, I'll link to this full essay. The parts we're going to skip, there's one that's kind of famous where it's him um, deciding not to shoot at a fascist who realizes he's making a break for it with his pants halfway up, and he has to pull his, uh, hold his pants up, and he's like, a person holding his pants up and running isn't a fascist. They're visibly a human being like yourself. Uh, a bit soft on fascism there. Or yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then there's another part where there's a, a Spaniard who probably Orwell dare says he has some Arab blood in him. He's d- darker skinned, and Orwell talks about how uh, when he found something missing, a person immediately accused this kid of being the um, thief and strip searched him. And the kid was very very embarrassed, but uh, Orwell says uh, ultimately he was innocent, but nonetheless let himself get searched with a sort of like uh, resignation that really affected Orwell. Well, Orwell was, I think, fairly good on color or on race prejudice. He'd be one of those guys who's like, because he was a cop in 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 uh, India, and I think that scarred him. He writes about it in a way that yeah. it, it does affect him a lot, and so he's pretty good on it. But we're going to skip over that a little bit. Well, it shows how unique of a person Orwell is that becoming a cop is what uh, radicalized him. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Here is a more of what the uh, the sort of like psyops and disinformation and you know power politics. Uh. Could you feel friendly towards somebody and stick up for him in a quarrel after you'd been ignominiously searched in his presence for property you were supposed to have stolen from him? No, you couldn't. But you might if you'd both been through some emotionally widening experience. That is one of the byproducts of revolution. Though in this case it was only the beginnings of a revolution and obviously foredoomed to failure. 4. The struggle for power between the Spanish Republican parties is an unhappy, far-off thing which I have no wish to revise at this date. I only mention it in order to say, believe nothing or next to nothing of what you read about internal affairs on the government side. It is all, from what source, party propaganda, that is to say, lies. The broad truth about the war is simple enough. The Spanish bourgeoisie saw their chance of crushing the labor movement and took it, aided by the Nazis and by the forces of reaction all over the world. It is doubtful whether more than that will ever be established. I remember saying once to Arthur Kersler, history stopped in 1936, at which he nodded in immediate understanding. We were both thinking of totalitarianism in general, but more particularly of the Spanish Civil War. Early in life I had noticed that no event is ever correctly reported in a newspaper, but in Spain, for the first time, I saw newspaper reports which did not bear any relation to the facts, not even the relationship which is implied in an ordinary lie. I saw great battles reported where there had been no fighting, and complete silence where hundreds of men had been killed. I saw troops who had fought bravely denounced as cowards and traitors, and others who had shot fired hailed as the heroes of imaginary victories. It's messed up on your recording, too. Oh, weird. Yeah, uh, it was uh, who hadn't fired a shot hailed as victors, uh, too. Um, yeah. yeah. And I saw newspapers in London retailing these lies and eager intellectuals building emotional superstructures over events that had never happened. I saw, in fact, history being written not in terms of what happened, but of what ought to have happened according to various party lines. Yet, in a way, horrible as all this was, it was unimportant. It concerned secondary issues, namely the struggle for power between the Comintern and the Spanish left-wing parties, and the efforts of the Russian government to prevent revolution in Spain. But the broad picture of the war which the Spanish government presented to the world was not untruthful. The main issues were what it said they were, but as for the fascists and their backers, how could they come even as near to the truth as that? How could they possibly mention their real aims? Their version of the war was pure fantasy, and in the circumstances it could not have been otherwise. 
The only propaganda line open to the Nazis and fascists was to represent themselves as Christian patriots saving Spain from a Russian dictatorship. This involved pretending that life in government Spain was just one long massacre. Vide the Catholic Herald or the Daily Mail. But these were child's play compared with the continental fascist press. And it involved immensely exaggerating the scale of Russian intervention. Out of the huge pyramid of lies which the Catholic and reactionary press all over the world built up, let me take just one point. The presence in Spain of a Russian army. Devout Franco partisans all believed in this. Estimates of its strength went as high as half a million. Now, there was no Russian army in Spain. There may have been a handful of airmen and other technicians, a few hundred at the most. But an army there was not. That was right, too. Some thousands of foreigners who fought in Spain, not to mention millions of Spaniards, were witnesses of this. Well, their test of impression at all upon the Franco propagandists, not one of whom had set foot in government Spain. Simultaneously, these people refused utterly to admit the fact of German or Italian intervention, at the same time as the German and Italian press were openly boasting about the exploits of their legionaries. I have chosen to mention only one point, but in fact the whole of fascist propaganda about the war was on this level. This kind of thing is frightening to me because it often gives me the feeling that the very concept of objective truth is fading out of the world. After all, the chances are that those lies, or at any rate similar lies, will pass into history. How will the history of the Spanish War be written? If Franco remains in power, his nominees will write history books and... To stick to my chosen point, that Russian army which never existed will become historical fact, and schoolchildren will learn about it generations hence. But suppose fascism is finally defeated and some kind of democratic government restored in Spain in the fairly future. Even then, how is the history of the war to be written? What kind of records will Franco have left behind him? Suppose even that the records kept on the government side are recoverable. Even so, how is a true history of the war to be written? For, as I have pointed out already, the government also dealt extensively in lies. From the anti-fascist angle, one could write a broadly truthful history of the war. But it would be a partisan history, unreliable on every minor point. Yet, after all, some kind of history will be written. And after those who actually remember the war are dead, it will be universally accepted. So for all practical purposes, the lie will have become truth. I know it is a fashion to say that most of recorded history is lies anyway. I am willing to believe that history is for the most part inaccurate and biased. But what is peculiar to our own age is the abandonment of the idea that history could be truthfully written. In the past, people deliberately lied, or they unconsciously coloured what they wrote, or they started the truth, well knowing that they must make many mistakes. But in each case, they believed that the facts existed and were more or less discoverable. And in practice, there was always a considerable body of fact which would have been agreed to by almost everyone. If you look up the history of the last war in... For instance, the Encyclopedia Britannica, you will find that a respectable amount of the material is drawn from German sources. A British and a German historian would disagree deeply on many things, even on fundamentals. But there would still be that body of, as it were, neutral fact on which neither would seriously challenge the other. It is just this common basis of agreement, with its implication that human beings are all one species of animal, that totalitarianism destroys. Nazi theory indeed specifically denies that such a thing as the truth exists. There is, for instance, no such thing as science. There is only German science, Jewish science, etc. The implied objective of this line of thought is a nightmare world in which the leader or some ruling clique controls not only the future but the past. If the leader says of such and such an event, it never happened, well, it never happened. If he says that two and two are five, well, two and two are five. If you've read 1984, you'll recognize that as yeah, coming into play. Yeah, see some germs in there. This prospect frightens me much more than bombs, and after our experiences of the last few years, that is not a frivolous statement. 
But is it perhaps childish or morbid to terrify oneself with visions of a totalitarian future? Before writing off the totalitarian world as a nightmare that can't come true, just remember that in 1925 the world of today would have seemed a nightmare that couldn't come true. Against that shifting phantasmagoric world in which black may be white tomorrow, and yesterday's weather can be changed by decree, there are in reality only two safeguards. One is that, however much you deny the truth, the truth goes on, as it were, behind your back, and you consequently can't violate it in ways that impair military efficiency. The other is that so long as some parts of the earth remain unconquered, the liberal tradition can be kept alive. Let fascism, or possibly even a combination of several fascisms, conquer the whole world, and those two conditions no longer exist. We in England underrate the danger of this kind of thing, because our traditions and our past security have given us a sentimental belief that it all comes right in the end,、mm. and the thing you most fear never really happens. Nourished for hundreds of years on a literature in which right invariably triumphs in the last chapter, we believe half instinctively that evil always defeats itself in the long run. Pacifism, for instance, is founded largely on this belief: don't resist evil, and it will somehow destroy itself. But why should it? What evidence is there that it does? And what instance is there of a modern industrialized state collapse unless conquered from the outside by military force? Oh yeah, so this is at the end of、uh, In Our Time, the Spanish Civil War. This episode is, I think, from a while ago. Yeah, April third, two thousand three. Yeah.、Uh, but I think it's they, they kind of get to something, and I think Orwell would be maybe relieved that this is the state of the historiography of the Spanish Civil War at this point. What's happened since 1974? There's this business of、um, healing and、uh, closure and that sort of stuff. Has that Franco left in the seven, in 1970? That been going on? Well, not since 1975. I think, in a sense,、yeah. the, the, the 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 deal of the negotiated transition, which came in in after Franco's death in the latter part of the 1970s, was was basically that a a veil of silence would be drawn over, in a sense, what had happened. That on the one hand there would be an amnesty for anti-Francoists, judicial amnesty, but on the other hand, no one would talk about what Frank what the regime had done to Spaniards in the the long years of its of its incumbency. Still less than trial for it. No, no. Truth、okay. and Reconciliation Commission, either, which is you know separate from judicial、um, retribution, but in a, and in a sense, the left, the 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 left had the civic humanitarianism to buy that during the transition because it was the least worst of the options. Because if you think about the firepower of the army,、um, the pro coup tendencies in the army in the late 1970s, and the vast amount of firepower, the the number of、um, phalangists of the single state party who still had f- weapons in their possession. So the idea of a, a, a redescent into civil war, in the sense, made that kind of deal, that pact of silence, perhaps and inevitable. That, yes, and 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 not just the. The real possibility, at least, of violence, if not、mm. of an outright civ- civil war,、mm. but also, I think, a, a genuine, a, a deep desire on the part of many ordinary Spaniards not to revisit、mm. what had happened in the past,、mm. um, not to open、yeah. up old wounds, and yet that had a tremendous cost because an enormous cost, which is coming out now as、yeah. as the mood in Spain is changing. How's it coming out now? Well, the mood in Spain is changing, particularly, I think, of of、uh, amongst younger generations who, who are more removed and so who actually want to know, who want to know what happens, which is why. As, as Paul、yeah. mentioned, there are these these、yeah. groups of archaeologists and forensic scientists excavating bone pits. There's also、um, a biological imperative here that there is this generation that experienced this thing is actually passing, and I, I do think there's a there's a very real connection with with the whole phenomenon of Holocaust memory here. That these that this this these terrible memories need to be put in the public domain. That we need to have public remembrance so that. You、yes. can then pass on from them, which is a cultural mood as well. I mean, that doesn't、yeah. only affect Spain. I mean, it's, it's sure. very, very marked、sure. not just in history, but 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 in、yeah. popular culture and public culture as、mm. well. I mean, I mean, fortunately, although there has been, I agree with everything that's been said, there has been this pact of silence. Historians didn't accept it, and there's been huge、mm. and and thank God、yes. because obviously、mm. most of the the people who were there are now dying off if they're not already dead. But there's been fantastic work done by local historians, and I think that. Historians since 1975, right across Spain, have actually 
fulfilled, you know, Walter ben Benjamin's injunction to historians to speak for the dead, and I think they've done that. There's been a lot of oral history, rather collecting of evidence, that sort of stuff. Yeah, vast yes. amounts. And I mean, sometimes the books are quite tedious because yeah. effectively they're listed names. Oral history names. often is, but it doesn't stop <laughs> it being invaluable. Absolutely. No, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And in a, in a real sense, they're war memorials. Yeah. Yes, they are. Memorials. Memorials. And, yeah. and to people so, who yeah. never had war memorials, yeah. who were given any... Yeah, so I thought that was a very uh, apposite... Uh, conversation based on Orwell's anxieties. And I think he was right that, I mean, my general take is he was right that we were entering an incredible dark time for transparency of power. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, we, you know, we all know about, well, not to get into the Kennedy assassinations, but all, all sorts of different assassinations that just the American government was uh, exporting and supporting across the world. And like and and we weren't we were by we were far from the only great power doing shit like that and i think we're basically like on the other end of that where i do think the internet presents a challenge for that sort of operation um i i don't think it it necessarily is one that's going to deliver a socialism mm -hmm. um but it is a problem that it uh, that i think i think that's why you see i guess more desperate or more blatant um disinformation and uh, that's why i think that we have trump is because like y you need to jam more of the channel than you used to yeah i think so there's something i don't know primordial about the spanish civil war in the same way that the french revolution is where you can see it if once you know about it you can you see it in everyday life mm -hmm. and i think that's what's so miraculous about the orwell essay is he grabs on to the primordial nature of the spanish civil war and to say that the conflict that's happening through violence is a conflict that the average person in modernity is living through every single day and i can like i feel like i can see it like i can see the world he's talking about he's talking about the spanish civil war but he might as well be talking about 2019 yeah and that's what i don't know it's just it's he's like a prophet in the way that he's not talking about the future but he's talking about things that are always true right yeah exactly like the the struggle basically yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll fast forward a little uh, just slightly here uh and uh also readers of 1984 will uh recognize orwell's faith in the proletarians and the workers uh also gets an airing in this essay here the backbone of the resistance against franco was the spanish working class especially the urban trade union members in the long run it is important to remember that it is only in the long run the working class remains the most reliable enemy of fascism simply because the working class stands to gain most by a decent reconstruction of society. Unlike other classes or categories, it can't be permanently bribed. <laughs> to say this is not to idealize the working class. In the long struggle that has followed the Russian Revolution, it is the manual workers who have been defeated, and it is impossible not to feel that it was their own fault. <laughs> time after time, in country after country, the organized working class movements have been crushed by open, illegal violence, and their comrades abroad, linked to them in theoretical solidarity, have simply looked on and done nothing. Still got to work on that. <laughs> and underneath this secret cause of many betrayals has lain the fact that between white and colored workers there is not even lip service to solidarity. The white working class and uh, intersectionality conversation, or we're already on that to them in theoretical solidarity have simply looked on and done nothing and underneath this secret cause of many betrayals has lain the fact that between white and colored workers there is not even lip service to solidarity who can believe in the class conscious international proletariat after the events of the past 10 years to the British working class the massacre of their comrades in Vienna Berlin Madrid or wherever it might be seemed less interesting and less important than yesterday's football match Yet this does not alter the fact that the working class will go on struggling against fascism after the others have caved in. One feature of the Nazi conquest of France was the astonishing defections among the intelligentsia, including some of the left-wing political intelligentsia. The intelligentsia are the people who squeal loudest against fascism, and yet a respectable proportion of them collapse into defeatism when the pinch comes. They are far-sighted enough to see the odds against them, and moreover they can be bribed, for it is evident that the Nazis think it worthwhile to bribe intellectuals. With the working class it is the other way about. Too ignorant to see through the trick that is being played on them, they easily swallow the promises of fascism. 
yet sooner or later they always take up the struggle again. They must do so because in their own bodies they always discover that the promises of fascism cannot be fulfilled. To win over the working class permanently, the fascists would have to raise the general standard of living, which they are unable and probably unwilling to do. Now, that part, I think, is super relevant to dealing with the Republican fascists that are currently controlling the government. Yeah. Uh, the big anxiety when Trump won is, oh, shit, what if he solidify, like destroys the Democratic Party by doing this sort of populist, uh, you know, uh, health care? We're, we're yeah. not going to leave every, anybody on health care. Like and new we're deal for white people. Yeah, and we're going to do a bunch of infrastructure spending in white states <laughs> mainly. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and they can't do that because they fundamentally can't put that money out there. Yeah. Uh, they, I mean, ultimately, they might be forced to um, do something like that uh, off the back foot, but they can't take the initiative because the party is too corrupt and too greedy. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's true of fascism. That, I think that's basically been proven true of fascism. Throughout the time. Well, I think it was interesting when near the end of the election, Paul Ryan... No, actually, sorry. After the election, when Trump is elected... Paul Ryan's critique of the Republican Party was that they were so used to being a minority party that they forgot what it's like to run in, uh, like and be in charge. But it's like, yeah, of course, like you only know how to crit- like a, like a far right party would only know how to critique like right. the the life of the working class. Like that doesn't that's not a, like a smart or even I wouldn't say that out loud if I were Paul Ryan because basically it's like yeah you're a Nazi propagandizer is what you're trying to say. Yeah, you have no constructive agenda. Yeah, like we can't solve what the the world that we built. It, it, it's been a decade and there's nothing there's no semblance of what a Republican health care plan might look like. Oh they, yeah. They don't give a fuck at all. There's also no Republican climate change plan. The only the Re- Republican climate change plan is to ask uh liberals why they they aren't pushing for uh nuclear energy enough <laughs> yeah. like that's all it is um yeah. or or to you know wank off about natural gas or something or carbon capture which by the way just a quick aside if carbon capture was coming down the pipe it would have happened by now that's just my uh, estimate fossil fuel companies would have figured that shit out if it was scalable but anyway we know over the working class permanently the fascists would have to raise the general standard of living which they are unable and probably unwilling to do. The struggle of the working class is like the growth of a plant. The plant is blind and stupid, but it knows enough to keep pushing upwards towards the light, and it will do this in the face of endless discouragements. What are the workers struggling for? Simply for the decent life, which they are more and more aware is now technically possible. Mm. Their consciousness of this aim ebbs and flows. In Spain, for a while, people were acting consciously, moving towards a goal which they wanted to reach and believed they could reach. It accounted for the curiously buoyant feeling that life in government Spain had during the early months of the war. The common people knew in their bones that the Republic was their friend, and Franco was their enemy. They knew that they were in the right, because they were fighting for something which the world owed them and was able to give them. One has to remember this to see the Spanish war in its true perspective. When one thinks of the cruelty, squalor, and futility of war, and in this particular case of the intrigues, the persecutions, the lies, and the misunderstandings, there is always the temptation to say, one side is as bad as the other. I am neutral. Here we go. In practice, however, one cannot be neutral, and there is hardly such a thing as a war in which it makes no difference who wins. Nearly always one side stands more or less for progress, the other side more or less for reaction. Mm. The hatred which the Spanish Republic excited in millionaires, dukes, cardinals, playboys, blimps, and whatnot, would in itself be enough to show one how the land lay. Hell yeah. In essence, it was a class war. If it had been won, the cause of the common people everywhere would have been strengthened. It was lost, and the dividend drawers all over the world rubbed their hands. That was the real issue. All else was froth on its surface. I love that section. Yeah. I, I remember coming across that during the uh, run-up to the 2016 election mm. and arguing with people about, is there a difference between Trump and the Republicans and Hillary and the Democrats? Right. And fuck yes, there's yeah, a difference between that. Like Hillary and the Democrats, they're bad. They are bad. They yeah. continue to be bad to this day. The Democratic Party is awful. It is better than the Republican Party. Yeah. You, you, you want to keep... Uh, 
power out of the fascist hands as much as possible. And I think that it ties into Orwell's thesis about like, there's no truth anymore in the way that like, sometimes you, you hear those kind of comments and it's like, you do know that the ability to dis- like distinguish objects or ideas from each other is what makes you human. Mm. And if you cannot distinguish a difference between two things, like from bad and less bad, then you're negating your your human responsibility of of cognizance. Right. And it's 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 really just to me it's such a transparent attempt to get to a stasis point. Yeah. Um like if you can cancel out both sides, you don't have to move a iota. Yeah. And it's 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 just it's it's just cowardice to me. It's cowardice masquerading as wisdom and contemplated uh, you know, conclusions. Yeah, it's 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 good not to trust any movement whose terminus point is where they started from. Right. Uh, now we'll move on a little bit to or Orwell analyzes the uh, geopolitical uh, uh, calculations of it. The outcome of the Spanish War was settled in London, Paris, Rome, Berlin. At any rate, not in Spain. After the summer of 1937, those with eyes in their heads realized that the government could not win the war unless there were some profound change in the international setup. And in deciding to fight on, Negrin and the others may have been partly influenced by the expectation that the World War, which actually broke out in 1939, was coming in 1938. The much-publicized disunity on the government side was not a main cause of defeat. The government militias were hurriedly raised, ill-armed and unimaginative in their military outlook. But they would have been the same if complete political agreement had existed from the start. At the outbreak of war, the average Spanish factory worker did not even know how to fire a rifle. There had never been universal conscription in Spain. And the traditional pacifism of the left was a great handicap. The thousands of foreigners who served in Spain made good infantry, but there were very few experts of any kind among them. The Trotskyist thesis that the war could have been won if the revolution had not been sabotaged was probably false. Orwell implies that strategy in his earlier writings. He's since come around a little bit. The thesis that the war could have been won if the revolution had not been sabotaged was probably false. To nationalize factories, demolish churches, and the issue revolutionary manifestos would not have made the armies more efficient. The fascists won because they were the stronger. They had modern arms and the others hadn't. No political strategy could offset that. The most baffling thing in the Spanish War was the behavior of the great powers. The war was actually won for Franco by the Germans and Italians, whose motives were obvious enough. The motives of France and Britain are less easy to understand. In 1936, it was clear to everyone that if Britain would only help the Spanish government, even to the extent of a few million pounds worth of arms, Franco would collapse and German strategy would be severely dislocated. By that time, one did not need to be a clairvoyant to foresee that war between Britain and Germany was coming. One could even foretell within a year or two when it would come. Yet in the most mean, cowardly, hypocritical way, the British ruling class did all they could to hand Spain over to Franco and the Nazis. Why? Because they were pro-fascist, was the obvious answer. (laughs) Undoubtedly they were, and yet when it came to the final showdown, they chose to stand up to Germany. It is still very uncertain what plan they acted on in backing Franco, and they may have had no clear plan at all. Whether the British ruling class are wicked or merely stupid is one of the most difficult questions of our time, and at certain moments a very important question. As to the Russians, their motives in the Spanish War are completely inscrutable. Before we get there, do you have anything that you want to say about that? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I have much. It's just it's just another example of Orwell just cutting right, almost like a sniper, right. just like putting Britain in his crosshairs and just being like, "Why would they do this?" Like, like probably because they're pro fascist. How about that? Which and this is written in 1943, right? Right. So the height of World War II. Yeah, yeah. To be like, yeah, they actually guess what? Like they were backed into joining uh, the fight against the Nazis. How about that? Like, yeah, it's it's a great mix of the sort of vulgar Marxist take, uh-huh. but also he he realizes there's something more to it than like right like yeah they were pro fascist but they ultimately were at, against fasc- the 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 fascist powers right yeah. Um, they ultimately recognize as a threat, even though they chose it over. Like it, it, it's he's he's the best parser of the sort of great power motives. Yeah, like, yeah. I think that section is 
as impressive to me as any sort of essay writing, political essay writing. I'll, also, just I'll put this in here because I want to know other writers we should follow their essay work. Um, uh, if anybody has suggestions of people who got their time as well as Orwell did, I'd love to hear it. Um, yeah, I think he he describes a world that I think after World War II really flattened the ambiguities of the the run up to uh, this like global conflict. Right. Where it's like they were we always knew they were bad, and we were just like waiting for the time to strike. I think it's pretty much the narrative <laughs> at yeah, this yeah, point. Yeah. And Orwell is pointing out a world where it's like a state is going to act in, in a way that it perceives that it's. Uh, its power can most be utilized. Right, exactly. And sometimes that's going to be aligning with things that could be very destructive for the average human being. And that's like the nature of a state currently. Right. Here is uh, more from this In Our Time uh, with a, a Paul Preston talks about the British role and, and if they could have done something. But it's sort of, I can't not ask it at the moment, Paul Preston. If, if the British had intervened more positively, as did Italy, Germany, Portugal, and Soviet Union. Do you think it would have changed not only the war there, but 20th century? Totally. I mean, I happen to think that Germany and Italy are in it because they want to weaken Britain and France. They see it as, as an operation to change the balance of power. And basically, the only person in the, or one of the very few people in the British ruling classes who sees this is Churchill, who effectively says that what happens is that the British let their class interests overcome their strategic interests. And the fact is that what happens in the Spanish Civil War is that Britain and France are strategically weakened at the expense of Germany and Italy. And I genuinely believe, I mean, I'd, you know, as a historian, I shouldn't go, I shouldn't even go there. I shouldn't get into counterfactual speculation. But I do believe, I mean, I'll, gi I'll, I'll give you one little bit of proof <laughs> of what it's worth. There's a meeting in Rome at, in the first week of January of 1937. Goering goes to Rome and talks, talks to Mussolini and he says to him something like, we've got three weeks. We've got to get Franco to win in the next three weeks because there is no way the British are not going to wake up and stop us. Mm. And, of course, the British don't wake up and they don't, they don't stop them. But had they done so, had they been stronger in, in, in opposition, then I think that the whole course of events, you know, the Anschluss, uh, Munich, I, th I think the whole thing would have been dramatically different. I mean, you know, if you push me, I'd end up saying there probably wouldn't have been a Second World War. That's going to have to stay there, otherwise we're going to be here all day on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's an interesting little uh, uh, you know, hypothetical there. Mm -hmm. um, and Inner Time is such like an excellent broadcast, probably my favorite podcast, I think. Yeah. And usually it's, that's one of the few times where this, where the commentator's like, I'm going for it. <laughs> like, right, yeah. With an opinion, like, you know what, like, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but mask yeah. off it, yeah I, I i need to look into paul preston a bit more i did like his performance in in that um uh so let's go a little bit you know the, the, i mean the spanish civil war really is the moment where uh bourgeois democracy fucked everybody for the yeah. 20th century like america and the uk uh uh failed they ultimate and fdr like this is on fdr there's a there's a a portion in the Hawkshield book where somebody's trying to lobby fdr to uh to to uh, support the Republicans with arms. And he's like, I can't hear you. And so he repeats himself louder. And he's like, no, what I mean is I can hear the, the Catholic lobby and like the oil lobby here way louder than I can hear you, which is annoying. Cause you had like fucking Hemingway, you had like popular, like the press like, was all there. The Lincoln brigade was there, which was right. this unofficial group of Americans that had volunteered to fight for the, uh, the left. Yeah. And and ultimately, FDR isn't able to support them. Um, but the American who is able to support a side in the um, in the war is the Texaco, the head of Texaco. And I'm actually I wasn't going to play this, but I think we need to go into it. Um, yeah. Let's see here. His novels, histories. It's from Adam Hochschild. In Madrid, nationalist troops plus units of their German and Italian allies marched through the city in a victory parade while warplanes were arrayed in formation to spell out Viva Franco in the sky. The exodus of refugees, mostly on foot, grew to half a million. Lifting our hearts to God, said a telegram of congratulations to Franco from Pope Pius XII. We give sincere thanks with your excellency for the victory of Catholic Spain. Doubtless also thankful was Torquil Reber, 
who knew that Texaco would at last be fully paid for all the oil he had supplied on credit. In total, Reber sold the Nationalists at least $20 million worth of oil during the Civil War, the equivalent, by the most conservative calculation, of some $325 million today. Texaco's tankers made 225 trips to Spain, and ships the company chartered another 156. A grateful Franco continued to buy Texaco oil long after the war, and later made Reber a knight of the Grand Cross of Isabella the Catholic, one of Spain's highest honors. Although the American press had ignored Tex... Yeah, that's her. That's the same Isabella. Oh, nice. Texaco's oil lifeline, the nationalists knew how essential it had been. After the war, the Franco government's oil monopoly publicly acknowledged the enthusiasm shown for our cause by Reber and Brewster, and the way Texaco had offered its assistance without reservations of any kind. A few years later, the undersecretary of the Spanish foreign ministry went further. Without American petroleum and American trucks and American credits, he told a journalist, we could never have won the Civil War. And uh, I, I've also seen a number. Basically, Texaco gave uh, on credit the uh, fascists twice the amount of oil that the Republican side had for the entire war. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thanks, America. Which is, I mean, that's that's such proof that it's it's way beyond business at that point. Oh, definitely. That, that's, that's 100% ideological in yep. a way that liberals, for whatever reason, could not be. They can't do it. Yeah, I don't know why they can't pull the trigger on that kind of Pussies. stuff. Pussies. Oh, my God. If I had a billion dollars <laughs> at the time of the Spanish Civil War. Yeah, yeah. Make a mech suit and just go Yeah, over. exactly. We would have had, like, the, a, the H-bomb, like... Uh, two decades earlier, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember reading like some Spanish Civil War right back to back with Weimar Germany, and just it's just like reading. There's a, a number of different countries like then the interim period between World War One and World mm -hmm. War Two, and you're just like, good lord! Like liberals are not good at self preservation. No, no, they fuck us. Um, so here is a bit more on Stalin's part of it. Questions of our time. And at certain moments, a very important question. As to the Russians, their motives in the Spanish War are completely inscrutable. Did they, as the Pinks believed, intervene in Spain in order to defend democracy and thwart the Nazis? Then why did they intervene on such a niggardly scale and finally leave Spain in the lurch? Or did they, as the Catholics maintained, intervene in order to foster revolution in Spain? Then why did they do all in their power to crush revolutionary movements, defend private property and hand power to the middle classes against the working class? Or did they, as the Trotskyists suggested, intervene simply in order to prevent a Spanish revolution? Then why not have backed Franco? Indeed, their actions are most easily explained if one assumes that they were acting on several contradictory motives. I believe that in the future we shall come to feel that Stalin's foreign policy, instead of being so diabolically clever as it is claimed to be, has been merely opportunistic and stupid. <laughs> but at any rate, this... Yeah, that's like... that. I, th I remember reading that a few years ago and thinking like, oh, this is kind of... Actually, a year, a year or so ago during the Russia stuff and thinking you people are getting a bit... You know, Putin is... Putin sucks. Putin might have blown up uh, citizens of his in an apartment complex. He, he yeah. might do some terrible stuff, but he's not this like master of the universe. Yeah, it's. I don't know how you can watch the last couple of years and assume that people in power have this like hyper level of competency no that we would that i don't know people seem to attribute with government heads being like well you know they're playing 12d chess or whatever yeah 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 i wish i mean if anything obama should have got that out of the heads of liberals for a while because like yeah he's like doing things that people could at at every point people could say oh this merrick garland thing is mm -hmm. just give him a chance to let the yeah, like, yeah. the full strategy play out well the case. full strategy is always at least like in the obama years is like just wait until how like look just wait until the republicans look like complete fools at the end yeah. of this yeah exactly the, the, eventually they'll be shamed into acting like um they don't want to kill us all. <laughs> <sighs> I'm just going to play a little bit from uh, Anthony Beaver on uh, the battle for Spain on uh, on uh, Stalin's motives here. Hiro's request for arms received no reply. 
For the first two weeks of the Spanish Civil War, the lack of comment on events from Moscow raised alarm in foreign communist circles. Stalin was about to purge the Red Army, Trotsky's creation, and he was deeply concerned at the prospect of a foreign adventure which might provoke Hitler at such a time of Soviet weakness. But the exiled Trotsky made use of this silence to accuse Stalin of betraying the Spanish Revolution and aiding the fascists. Whether or not it was Trotsky who goaded him into action, Stalin must have realized that Soviet communism would lose all credibility and probably the loyalty of European parties if nothing was done to help the Republic. Stalin therefore decided to send aid to the Spanish government, but little more than the necessary minimum. In this way he would neither frighten the British government, which he needed as a potential ally, nor provoke the Germans. On the 3rd of August, popular demonstrations and spontaneous indignation meetings took place all over Russia. Factory workers made voluntary contributions to help the Republic, and the government sent its first non-military supplies. Comintern officials, using false names, were also sent to Spain to make sure that the young Spanish Communist Party should not step out of line. Only at the end of September did Stalin decide to provide military help. The first shipment left the Crimea on the 26th of September and did not reach Cartagena until the 4th of October. I think that's interesting how Trotsky sort of like goads... Stalin into being like, hey, uh, I thought you were the head of the communist country in yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah. Are you going to maybe do something here? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I gotta say, I don't, I'm um, very much new to a lot of the Stalin uh, Trotsky drama. Um, I've never, I haven't sunk a lot of time into trying to parse it out, but what's the, what's the, what's the, like, Trotsky always seems to come out on the good side of all this stuff. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, I'm probably, I've got to be either the same or yeah. slightly behind where you are. I, 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 the idea of someone calling himself a Trotskyist now seems like it's still kind of like alien to me. It's weird that like I still see it used as an insult in a way that really pissed off Orwell in not only looking back in the Spanish Civil War, but uh, more more explicitly in spilling the Spanish beans. Yeah, a and, trot. Yeah, you're a trot, and like. Yeah. It's, I, I, it's see, it always seems very hard to define outside of very historical situations. Yeah, where it doesn't seem like being a trot is that bad of a thing. Like Orwell too, like all says, and I think in homage to Catalonia that he understood the um, the idea that you would stop the revolutionary activity and fight the fight. Uh -huh. His problem was when you started rolling it back or the yeah, revolutionary yeah. gains. Um, and that just seems like the right, like that seems like the perfect synthesis position to have. I'm yeah. Just. Now we've got one final section and this is, I mean, this is really Orwell at his best here. Um, he mentions, you mentioned this Italian militia man he saw um, on the front when he just arrived in Spain and he he also mentions him at the beginning to homage to Catalonia, and he had a really big impact on Orwell. And uh, here he is kind of talking about him and fascists and uh, hierarchy, classless utopias and all that sort of stuff. The other memory is of the Italian militia man who shook my hand in the guardroom the day I joined the militia. I wrote about this man at the beginning of my book on the Spanish War, Homage to Catalonia, and do not want to repeat what I said there. When I remember... Oh, how vividly his shabby uniform and fierce, pathetic, innocent face. The complex side issues of the war seem to fade away, and I see clearly that there was at any rate no doubt as to who was in the right. In spite of power politics and journalistic lying, the central issue of the war was the attempt of people like this to win the decent life, which they knew to be their birthright. It is difficult to think of this particular man's probable end without several kinds of bitterness. Since I met him in the Lenin barracks, he was probably a Trotskyist or an anarchist. And in the peculiar conditions of our time, when people of that sort are not killed by the Gestapo, they are usually killed by the GPU. But that does not affect the long-term issues. This man's face, which I saw only for a minute or two, remains with me as a sort of visual reminder of what the war was really about. He symbolizes for me the flower of the European working class, harried by the police of all countries, the people who fill the mass graves of the Spanish battlefields and are now, to the tune of several millions, rotting in forced labour camps. When one thinks of all the people who support or have supported fascism, one stands amazed at their diversity. What a crew! Think of a programme which at any rate for a while could bring Hitler, Pétain, 
Montague Norman, Pavlich, William Randolph Hearst, Stryker, Buchmann, Ezra Pound, Juan March, Cocteau, Tyson, Father Coughlin, the Mufti of Jerusalem, Arnold Lunn, Antonescu, Spengler, Beverly Nichols, Lady Houston, and Marinetti all into the same boat. But the clue is really very simple. They're all people with something to lose, or people who long for a hierarchical society and dread the prospect of a world of free and equal human beings. Behind all the ballyhoo that is talked about godless Russia and the materialism of the working class lies the simple intention of those with money or privileges to cling to them. Ditto, though it contains a partial truth, with all the talk about the worthlessness of social reconstruction not accompanied by a change of heart. The pious ones, from the Pope to the yogis of California, are great on the change of heart, much more reassuring from their point of view than a change in the economic system. That part amazes me. Yeah. Because who were the yogis of California at that time? I don't, yeah, I don't. In the 40s, like it seems way too early. It seems like, way too early. He's like referencing kind of like, uh, like the Eastern meditation, like New Ageism, right? But that's in in common parlance. That's thought of at least 20 years after what he's writing. And if it is around, it doesn't seem like it's localized to California at that yeah, point. Yeah, it like, can't possibly be a popular notion. Well, because like T. S. Eliot, uh, you know, does a lot of that sort of stuff, and yeah, uh, he has a lot of those Eastern influences. And, yeah, and, but it's always for the greater good of the Anglican Church, right? And I'm, I'm sure Ezra Pound had similar sort of motives uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and things like that. Like, like they, that stuff was influential, but to localize it as the Yogis of California is yeah. just like fucking hilarious. To do a dude. deep dive on that. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder who he's thinking of. If there was some book, uh, yeah, I don't know. With all the talk about the worthlessness of social reconstruction not accompanied by a change of heart. The pious ones, from the Pope to the Yogis of California, are great on the change of heart. Much more reassuring from their point of view than a change in the economic system. Pétain attributes the fall of France to the common people's love of pleasure. One sees this in its right perspective if one stops to wonder how much pleasure the ordinary French peasant's or working man's life would contain compared with Pétain's own. The damned impertinence of these politicians, priests, literary men and what not who lecture the working-class socialist for his materialism. All that the working man demands is what these others would consider the indispensable minimum without which human life cannot be lived at all. Enough to eat, freedom from the haunting terror of unemployment, the knowledge that your children will get a fair chance, a bath once a day, clean linen reasonably often, a roof that doesn't leak, and short enough working hours to leave you with a little energy when the day is done. Not one of those who preach against materialism would consider life livable without these things. Mm -hmm. And how easily that minimum could be obtained if we chose to set our minds to it for only twenty years. To raise the standards of living of the whole world to that of Britain would not be a greater undertaking than the war we have just fought. Mm. I don't claim, and I don't know who does. It's like uh, AOC using war metaphors for the Green New Deal. Yeah, exactly obtained if we chose to set our minds to it for only 20 years. To raise the standards of living of the whole world to that of Britain would not be a greater undertaking than the war we have just fought. I don't claim, and I don't know who does, that that would solve anything in itself. It is merely that privation and brute labor have to be abolished before the real problems of humanity can be tackled. The major problem of our time is the decay of the belief in personal immortality, and it cannot be dealt with while the average human being is either drudging like an ox or shivering in fear of the secret police. How right the working classes are in their materialism. How right they are to realize that the belly comes before the soul, not in the scale of values, but in point of time. <laughs> Understand that, and the long horror that we are enduring becomes at least intelligible. All the considerations that are likely to make one falter, the siren voices of a Pétain or of a Gandhi, the inescapable fact that in order to fight one has to degrade oneself, the equivocal moral position of Britain, 
with its democratic phrases and its coolie empire, the sinister development of Soviet Russia, the squalid farce of left-wing politics. All this fades away and one sees only the struggle of the gradually awakening common people against the lords of property and their hired liars and bumsuckers. The question is very simple. Shall... Sorry, I just want to replay that line because it's my favorite in the essay. The siren voices of a Pétain or of a Gandhi. The inescapable fact that in order to fight one has to degrade oneself. The equivocal moral position of Britain with its democratic phrases and its coolie empire. The sinister development of Soviet Russia. The squalid farce of left-wing politics. All this fades away and one sees only the struggle of the gradually awakening common people against the lords of property and their hired liars and bumsuckers. The question is very simple. Shall people like that Italian soldier be allowed to live the decent, fully human life which is now technically achievable? Or shan't they? Shall the common man be pushed back into the mud, or shall he not? I myself believe, perhaps on insufficient grounds, that the common man will win his fight sooner or later. But I want it to be sooner and not later, sometime within the next hundred years, say, and not sometime within the next ten thousand years. That was the real issue of the Spanish War, and of the last war, and perhaps of other wars yet to come. He's the goat. I love Orwell. Yeah. Uh, just crushes it there. Like, as a as a statement of socialistic values, Yeah. like, and what... You, what what matters yeah like that is you can't really beat that well, it's a way of just winnowing away the the complexity that we the cobwebs that we talked about earlier where it's you can't ever nail down a fact because every the the details of modern life are constantly shifting based mm-hmm. on who you ask and who's going to tell you what and orwell is saying like this is the struggle and the struggle is it's always going to be a different configuration of this essential problem yeah, that's the most important part of Orwell and the Spanish Civil War to me, is that he didn't come away from it disillusioned. He, 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 I think it's in homage to Catalonia, he talks about, like, despite all this, I come away, like, the, the str- like struggling with actual regular people, you know, regardless of what was happening in the corridors of power to, like, um, you know, subvert them. Mm-hmm. The, the genuine effort, uh, given by comrades he was with, like, get, like, basically made him um not optimistic but if that's that's the wrong word to use with orwell but sort of like uh you know uh um a sort of a happy warrior um, yeah sort of thing. clarifying almost that there's something that there's something emboldening about like the beginning of wisdom is is being able to define call things by their proper name Mm -hmm. and once that like once you get that configuration or that key in your head the struggle becomes much more uh straightforward right and he also does something that i think the left needs to learn or part of the left needs to learn about i mean mean, it circles back to the there's no such thing as a war where it doesn't matter who wins yeah like you, you you can't let your desire for liberation be turned off because politicians are doing politics like they yeah. like they will always suck they'll always fuck you they and they might literally lead to like uh killing fields um but you have to be uh but but that can't like make you uh sort of feel that but all sides are the same and this is all just uh like let's just retreat to nihilism yeah um and and that's what i i love about this essay so much um so uh if you enjoyed this uh you'll want to probably uh, become a patron i would imagine at patreon.com you're some slash, sort of fool yeah slash literary hangover because we're going to be going through a lot of orwell essays we're going to basically I, I want literary hangover to sort of colonize orwell's uh you know there's a lot of it, we we talked about Henry James right in the uh, um, in Nathaniel Hawthorne somewhere in England. Grace's ears are breaking. Yeah, up. Um, well, literary hangover is going to develop a presence around uh, George Orwell. Okay. I mean, Hitchens did that too. Hitchens did that with a lot of people, um, uh, particularly Orwell. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think it's. I think you need stewards of certain people's reputations, and uh, and I. 
there's no there's no writer who I've read more at this point uh, than George Orwell. Like I ju- I just finished his fifty essays the collection uh, this past weekend. I I'm like, is that all? That's all there is. Like, yeah, I, can yeah. I have more? I was reading the Michael Sheldon, but bi- or listening to the Michael Sheldon biography, and I wish that was like thirty hours as opposed to fifteen. Like, yeah. I, I can't get enough of uh, this guy, so I hope uh, I hope listeners you enjoy this as well. Um, Alex, uh, do you have anything else you want to add? I uh, know. I just think that in a time where the unfortunate part of being part of the canon in the way that Orwell is with 1984 and in uh, Animal Farm is your ideas are used by every uh, reactionary piece of shit. Right. Anti-revolution. Not, and not, we're not just talking fascists here. We're talking like uh capitalist fascist, like Apple. Like it's absurd yeah. to think that 1984 is synonymous with someone like Steve jobs. Y- yes. It's disgusting. Yeah, it's actually. Gross. And so like the idea that we could assert a more, uh, a more genuine or that you would assert a more genuine portrait of Orwell is, uh, yeah, always necessary. And now that you mentioned that, I just want to bring up a, a quote from Orwell um, that might in- surprise people a little bit. And I'd be curious if this is in your collection here. I, I'd be, if it is, I'm going to buy that definitely like immediately. Um, but, uh, Orwell's reviewing a book here. This is from, uh, a, a good book on Orwell, uh, uh, called, uh, it's by, uh, Philip Bounds, Orwell and Marxism, the political and cultural thinking of George Orwell by Philip Bounds. Here is a quote. Um, Oh, here's one uh, in 1939. Uh, this is from a review of The Clue of History by John McMurray. This is George Orwell saying, I personally would agree with Professor McMurray that humanity must move in the direction of communism or perish. <laughs> uh, that's a Orwell quote you wouldn't have expected. Yeah. Uh, here's another one. This is from the front, uh, an essay called The Frontiers of Art and Propaganda in 1941. He says, The most lively criticism of the last 10 years uh, has nearly all of it been the work of Marxist writers, people like Christopher Caldwell and Philip Henderson and Edward Upward. Uh, who look on every book virtually as a political pamphlet and are far more interested in digging out its political and social implications than its literary qualities in the narrow sense. And that's also what a uh, literary hangover hmm. is uh, is looking to do. So I would like to think that Orwell would would appreciate literary hangover. Uh, and if, like I said, if you do uh, patreon.com slash literary hangover, I want to get to 200 patrons in the next few months. Uh, we got We're about 40 away, so we can get there. Alex, thank you uh, once again. Yeah. And uh, we will see you uh, the next time uh, we release one of these boys, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) 